I'm going to start off actually with a little audience participation. I want you to raise your hand if you can definitively tell me with no doubt in your mind what was the name of the first person who walked on the moon and what country did they come from? How many people know the answer? There's actually some people with their hands down. That's amazing. Okay, now I want you to do the same thing. Raise your hand if you definitively know what was the first mobile robot to land on the moon and what country did it come from? There's no hands up. Okay, uh, one hand, okay, there we are. Yeah, the space nerd is there. But um, the reason I ask that is a little bit what Garvey said before. Because uh, he talked a lot about, you know, why send humans, send robots. It's because nobody gives a crap about robots in the end of it all. Um, you know, and, and what, I get, what happens, the reason I had to figure out how to ask that question is I was sitting in the office of Harry Reid when he was head of the Senate, and his chief science advisor said exactly the same that Garvey said up here. Why send humans, you can send robots. And there's two reasons. One is that I don't know a single robot that pays taxes. And the other one is I don't know a single person who's inspired by robots after the human goes and does it. If once, once the first human runs on, uh, gets on Mars and steps on Mars, and the person says, uh, this is one small step for a woman and, uh, and one large step for mankind, um, Viking will not get a footnote in a history book anywhere. Um, so humans do matter, uh, but it's also insp inspirational. Um, if you're not inspiring the next generation of going somewhere, um, you're gonna die as a species, you're gonna die as a country. So um, having started with that, environmental control, uh, I call it the forgotten subsystem. I was very, very uh, encouraged to see with uh, Ken Bowersox's talk that he had ECLIS on a lot of charts. I have a feeling that Robin Gaines at NASA had something to do with that. Um, but I also noticed, George, with yours, well, you didn't have uh, ECLIS on your charts when you took, uh, labeled a bunch of subsystems. So what I'm gonna do first is I'll do a little bit of just who I am, where I come from, one, only one chart, no long videos, anything I promise. Um, Paragon uh, has been in business for 27 years, almost, 26 and a half years. Um, we're in three locations in, in Tucson, Arizona, which is where I'm from, where I'm going to be driving back tonight. Uh, we also have offices in Denver and Houston. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're AS9100 certified. We provide flight support equipment for all sorts of different spacecraft. As was mentioned, I've been on uh, pretty much the design of every single human space flight uh, spacecraft uh, uh, since 1990s. Um, and one of the other things is just uh, about two years ago, we announced that we teamed up with Honeywell, uh, Giener, and PCI to really provide life supports across the gamut of government and commercial sectors. Um, in fact, I know that NASA now calls us the consortium. And I, I don't know, the Collins people are here somewhere. I don't know if you guys have heard that. Um, but anyway, that's who we are. We've done uh, all sorts of life support. We also do thermal control. Humans have to be kept at a very specific temperature. So once you can do that, you're pretty good at doing thermal control for an avionics box. Um, one of the things, if you have heard of Paragon, you may have heard that we broke Red Bull's record f uh, fi almost five years ago. Out here in Roswell, we hold the record for the highest skydive in the world. That was also the first operational spacesuit built in the United States in 30 years that actually went operational, uh, that we built for that program. And we test that. So okay, there's, the, there's the, the cell. So what are my objectives for today? First one is I want to familiarize yourself, familiar guys, familiarize yourselves with uh, environmental control and life support systems. ECLIS is what it's known as. You've seen it on a few charts. Some of you maybe understand what it is. But really, it is, the, it is why uh, if you're going to send humans to, uh, to the space, you need it. You have to have it. We may invent warp drive. We may invent beamers like in, on Star Trek. But no matter how you look at it, humans are not going to evolve fast enough that you don't need a life support system in space. <clears throat> I want to raise the awareness of environmental control. I want it when you guys get out of this room, you're talking to your Congress people or anybody else who say, hey, and, or NASA or everybody else say, hey, what are you doing about ECLIS? What are you doing about ECLIS? Because it's the long pole in the tent. It is the thing that is going to keep us from making moon in 2024. A lot of us in the industry, when they announced, hey, we're going to put boots on the ground in 2024, we said, great, you can shove a boot out of a, out of a, of a lander and it'll hit the ground. It just won't have a foot in it. Um, you know. Um, I chart, I know. I'm not really going to go through this whole, whole thing here. Um, I thought somebody had a, had a uh, thing here. But really, environmental control and life support is, comes up from three things. It's the actual life support. It's the thermal control, keeping the human at the right temperature, generally 70 plus or minus 2 degrees. 
And then the crew systems that go with that. And that's often very forgotten. It's the, it's the toilets, it's the, um, uh, it's the, the, uh, the clothing, the, every, everything pretty much that a human needs, if you need clothing at all, and that's a whole other point in itself. Um, it's interesting, I, uh, uh, Wayne mentioned about a certain person who was uh, debuting a rocket a little while ago or doing a press thing on it, and they said, sort of, yeah, environmental control is easy. Uh, back in, I uh, can't remember what year it was, but IAC in Guadalajara, of course, Elon Musk said, well, here's my new BFR, it's gonna take 500 people to Mars. I got a call from, a, from a, uh, a person in the press that I'd known for 20 years, and they said, so what do you think about this? And I said, well, I don't see where the bathrooms are. And, and uh, the person kind of laughed and they said, no, that's, that's really serious, that's my thing. I can tell you that, spa that spacecraft that size cannot hold 500 people because you do not have enough room for the bathrooms and the storage and the processing urine and feces and everything else you need to do. This is another reason, by the way, they put me after lunch is because I talk about urine and feces and everything else. Uh, um, it's not because I want to save money at the, at the, at the break afterwards, I promise. Um, so then a year later, down at Adelaide, Elon Musk got up and he, he now had his, had his new vehicle. He was down down to 100 people. I get a call from that same reporter. The reporter says, hi, Grant. What do you think about the, the new thing down in Adelaide? I said, did you ask him where the bathrooms are? Um, and the guy laughed again. But that's it. That's, well, that's our area. That's what we have to worry about is wh how do you accommodate human beings, um, which is the real raison d'etre of, of human, li uh, human space flight. Um, so what are the major elements? Again, you don't have to read the chart, but it's really food management, going around, starting in the upper right-hand corner and doing a counterclockwise. It's food management. What are you gonna feed people and how is it gonna be stored? Packaging is a real big problem. Air management, keeping the pressure right, keeping the oxygen level right, keeping the, the nitrogen level right, if you have nitrogen as a buffer gas, keeping the CO2 out of the system, keeping all the other things we put out. We put out methane, we uh, fart, as they say. Um, we, uh, we put out a bunch of other chemicals too, and uric acid and stuff in our urine and stuff like that, and ammonias and stuff that you gotta scrub out. Um, the human accommodations itself, the medical provisions, waste collection, I'm, I'm uh, gonna go through this pretty quick because I actually have this chart later to talk in more detail. Uh, water management, we all have to drink. In fact, we have sort of a, a rule of threes in the, in the environmental control world. Three seconds, three days, um, I mean three seconds, three minutes, uh, three days and three weeks. And that's three seconds is how long you can last before you essentially are emulized when you lose pressure. Uh, three, di uh, three days is, uh, I mean, three minutes is what you can do uh, without oxygen. You can generally hold your breath for about three minutes. Three days is about how long you can go without water and three weeks is about how long you can go without food. Um, Crew waste management, it's once you collect the waste, you've gotta be able to do something with it. Some cases you just throw it away, some cases you recycle it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then thermal control, again, is the keeping the, not only the humans, but the environmental control system on a spacecraft, a human spacecraft also usually is used to control the battery temperatures, avionics temperatures, stuff of that nature. In fact, one thing about environmental control and life support is that we touch everything on the spacecraft. Uh, in general, Paragon's usually on the programs we're on, we do the first full up system schematic of the whole spacecraft because we have to know where everything is and what we're gonna cool and what we're gonna heat and how, what we're gonna keep at the right temperature. So, why, is that, why do I call it the forgotten subsystem? I actually, I do this when I give presentations with, even with NASA people in the room. Is that the human payload? And I, I apologize to all the women in the room that's a little bit male-centric, but it's also an iconic picture. But is that your payload when you are doing human life support? Anybody? What? No. It's with a life support system. You will never ever send a human into space without a life support system. It's a very, very bad publicity and an ugly, uh, ugly end for the whole program. You always have a life support system. So it's very interesting working with rocket people because they build a rocket and then they say, oh, let's put a, uh, let's put a, a, a spacecraft on it and then let's shove a life support system in it. In fact, if you wanna see people from NASA turn green and especially people from Marshall, tell them that NASA is actually a biology organization with a little bit of, a space, of rocket technology thrown in. Um, uh, yeah, I've seen a few people turn green when I say that, but in reality, every spa uh, spacecraft for humans that NASA has built, of course, is governed by humans. That's why the shuttle um, throttled back, because they wanted to stay below three Gs. It's why it's actually, uh, they were trying to get a, the, the wings and everything so they could get the Gs down. We're designing things around humans all the time, 
But when you have a bunch of rocket people, people designing the, the human stuff, they tend to think of the rocket first. Also, rockets are sexier. I mean, they, they have fire and they go up uh, when they fail. They fail fairly spectacularly. Um, so is it forgotten? I mean, you, know, you know, you can't take my word for it here. This was actually from The Verge, which is a publication read a lot, uh, definitely in Silicon Valley, from July 18th. And they had this list of four problems, and they had quotes from NASA people. And they said the four problems of going back to the moon, transportation, talked all about the rockets, the outpost, which was also known as the gateway. And I will say this, I don't often agree with uh, Bob Zubrin, and in this case, I disagree venomously, and I gotta admit with Garvey also, the outpost is absolutely needed. Not to get to Mars, not to get to the moon necessarily, but if you wanna get to Mars, you need something that tests your life support system for a long duration, and that's the system will do it. And I'll tell you why space station won't necessarily hack it. Uh, the landing, they talk about the landing, they talk about there's no mention of the environmental control system in the landing vehicle on, on the problems that, uh, that NASA will have, except for the thermal control because, of course, getting through lunar nights and lunar days is very tough, uh, two, long, two week long days, two week long nights. Um, and then they talk about the suits. And yes, of course, suits are, in fact, suits are essentially an environmental control system writ small, and you, you put a person in it because that's what it's supposed to do is keep a person alive inside of it. Um, but mainly what they talked about in that thing is uh, surface uh, versus on over capability, how, mo how much mobility they had. It didn't really talk about how do you replace the oxygen, how do you clean the suit, how do you keep dust out, how do you keep dust from ruining your systems and stuff like that. So here's another audience participation. How many people left their hotel this morning worrying if they had enough oxygen to make it through the day? Anybody? Anybody? The only people who said yes in that in the talk are people who smoke. But other than that, it, 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 you don't worry about it here, but that's a continuous worry when you get into space. And in fact, that is why I started Paragon, because I know that no matter whatever all the technology goes, if we want to have humans go out to space, you're going to need life support. So I've got a guaranteed, uh, guaranteed market for the rest of eternity, really. Um, finally, uh, popular culture. One of the problems about a space conference like this, which I, I love, I love this space conference, it's the best one I go to for a lot of reasons, but, and Pat does a wonderful job, is that a lot of humans do not care. We're sort of in the bubble, you know, sort of like how Washington's in the bubble, everybody else, we're sort of in the space bubble, a lot of us. But uh, it makes it out into popular culture right anyway with the Martian, you know, if oxygen breaks down, I'll suffocate. I don't know if you can read this, I apologize for the, uh, the word at the bottom there. Um, I know a lot of people have asked me what was the most unrealistic thing about the Martian. And do you know what the most unrealistic thing about the Martian was? How modern the NASA buildings looked. <laughs> uh, have, have, I mean, anybody who has worked with NASA, you're generally in cinder block buildings that have wires running down the ceiling because they weren't even wired for, for wi you know, now they have Wi-Fi and the, and the wires are starting to go away again, so they're actually looking okay. But, um, no, that's a joke. I mean, obviously, as you're, if you're an engineer, yeah, you know, it was the windstorm that blow, you know, blew over a rocket and stuff like this, which wouldn't happen. But um, is this new? I mean, am I up here saying something that hasn't been known before? George Mueller, I think Mueller, I think most of you have heard the name. If you're of my age, if you're younger, you should look the person up. Uh, it was very integral in the success of the Apollo program. In 1966, it said, he was advocating for essentially an Apollo 8 mission around Mars instead of like Apollo 8 went around the moon, doing one around Mars. He said, for three weeks, and we have to prove navigation, life support, and communications. This is a quote. I did not, the only thing I did is bold life support on this. Our robotics programs, which are fantastic, and, and despite what I said in the beginning, I love them. I'm a space geek. I love them. Um, they, they've proven out pretty much the navigation. Uh, and communications. I don't think that's a problem anymore. Life support, we have no existence proof on Earth or anywhere that we can get a person to Mars and back. We just do not have one. And again, a lot of people say, but space station. Space station has been up there for 20 years, right? And we've had people alive. Space station has never gone more than five months without a, what I would call a major failure to the life support system in one way or another. Major failure being that it, the, the life support was in a degraded mode or degrading mode which were, were, uh, were affecting operations. Then there's some reasons for that. Um, so again, here maybe getting a little bit into, into ISS. Maintenance, what's different? Or what, how does ISS handle things? For one thing, maintenance and logistics. That's gonna come up a lot in the rest of my talk. Um, they have 
uh, an ORU philosophy. ORU stands for orbital replacement unit. If a pump fails, they manifest a new pump, goes up to space. They are actually designed in to be able to pull out the pump and replace it. Sometimes things break that they didn't think they were going to have to replace. Uh, I know I was talking to John Curry last night about the solar arrays. I have a little bit of a, a piece of my heart because I was actually the chief design engineer for those when I worked at Lockheed before I started Paragon. Um, but some things broke there that they weren't expecting and they had to fix. But we generally have this six to eight month cycle, something breaks or something looks like it's degrading, they get it manifest, they get it launched up there, they replace it and it goes. On the way to Mars, that's not gonna happen. You can't just sit there and send another pump when they need it. Um, uh, for radiation, we need a safe haven in the long duration when you're outside the Van, Ari Van Allen radiation belts. In the ISS, you're protected by the, mirror, by the Earth's magnetic field, so a lot of the radiation doesn't get to you. But you still are limited by radiation, generally why uh, pi uh, why astronauts don't fly more than five to seven times, they start hitting the radiation limits, um, radiation exposure limits. Recycling enclosure. The ISS um, has a lot of downtime that are excessive uh, that won't be allowed, allowable in Mars flights. Um, crew size and volume, it's about a three to six person vehicle. They're in rigid pressurized cans. Um, one of the problems about rigid pressurized vehicles is that they're made out of aluminum. It turns out when you're in deep space and you have a, a galactic radiation coming in, you get a scattering effect. So you actually get worse radiation inside than outside the vehicle when you get hit by radiation. Um, the decision making chain for, for ISS, there's a full up mission control. There's a back room and a back room to the back room down there. Something goes wrong. You have a whole bunch of T people looking at the problem and a whole bunch of T people telling you what to do uh, to fix it. And then another thing that gets a little technical is called thermal turndown. The space station is very, very close to this big thing called Earth. It's at about 300 Kelvin. When you start going to, uh, to deep space, you're surrounded by a four Kelvin universe. And so you get cold very quickly. Everybody who's seen Apollo 13, the movie? Anybody not seen Apollo 13, the movie? Okay, there we go. Um, you, you know, they got really cold. It's because they had to shut down the power systems. That's what happens if you're thermally biased that way. Um, so what's now different? Everything's different when we go to moon, when we go to the moon for long duration, when we go to Mars. Um, we no longer really have a way of replacing ORUs. You cannot send up a pump. The other thing that's, that's not thought of a lot of is, would you want to do an EVA, an extra vehicle activity on the way to Mars? The thing about doing an EVA around the station is that even though they, they maintain clips and handholds and everything else, it's a little bit mountain climbing. However, if you do let go, you stay within the vicinity of the vehicle to some degree. There's actually small, uh, small perturbation orbital mechanics where you actually would kind of rotate around the vehicle a little bit, as long as you didn't push off too hard. That doesn't happen on the way to Mars. You lose, you lose a grip, you may never get back. So there's a question of whether you'd want to ever do an EVA. Um, the logistics resupply. Spares have got to be really common. Common, in other words, you use the same O-ring for different types of pumps maybe, or you uh, use the same um, electronics parts or something like that. And they've got to be very small and very few. Think about it if you were on a trip across the United States in your car and you had to bring every single part that might break on your car. And you wouldn't have a place for your passengers, let alone your baggage. So you've really got to have the ability to replace only those things that are small, again, like O-rings. You wouldn't take a whole engine in the back of your car with you. You'd maybe take a few new you know, uh, piston rings, stuff like that to fix your car. That's got to be really, really well thought out. It has been thought out on ISS, and they've done some brilliant thinking on that, but they've always had the crutch of they're only 30 minutes away from Earth, they're only eight, eight months from being resupplied, and they can launch up fairly big things. Um, and then also uh, the, the launch vehicles. I'm going to hurry up a little bit here. Um, major elements, the, the, the items of concern to me and to a lot of the ECLIS community, we all have different emphasis, food packaging. This is the number one trash thing. What, what every progress it leaves, every sickness it leaves, uh, to a lesser extent the dragon, they're packed full of trash. And that trash, a lot of it has to do with food packaging. How do you get food packaging uh, down to a size that you can send to Mars? Um, fire suppression. Fire suppression system on the space station is CO2. Uh, you, there's a reason why you don't want to spray CO2 in your cabin. Um, so we, we're actually advocating fine water mist. Um, clothing itself, what is the clothing? How often do you wash it? How much do you wash it at all? Do you just throw it away? Do you make it edible? I don't know. But 
Uh, medical provisions. Medical provisions are really, really interesting, and that's a whole talk into itself. But what do you, what do you prepare for? What trauma? What, what type of things? Extracting a tooth? Uh, setting a bone? It, what, what, what exactly do you need and not need? Uh, what can go wrong with a human, which is a fair amount of stuff? Uh, waste collection wa and urine processing, uh, fecal processing, all these things. How do you get the water back out? How do you recycle the water? All interesting things to us. And then um, one other thing is two fluid thermal systems. Somebody, I think it was Bowersox this morning, was talking about specifications. One of the specifications that disturbed us the most was that um, they specified uh, internal and external thermal loops. If you want to ask me about that, we'll do it during break. I'm going to be running out of time, but there's a reason why you don't want internal and external thermal loops. Think about it. You have to have at least double the number of pumps. I'm almost done. Okay. Okay. So what's the philosophy and what's the design choices here? Um, what you want to do is get the, the maintenance down to the lowest level. You want credible systems, accessible, everything accessible. Think about it, having to repair your car across the street and you can't get out of your car. So when you're going across, you've got to repair it from the inside. Um, automation, there's a lot of automation things going on and you want to make it as simple as possible. Um, I'm, I'm a really big uh, uh, advocate of keeping things simple uh, as opposed to complex, what you do. Um, and then keeping uh, the pressurized volume too. I talked about aluminum cans. I would go with a, a flexible cans. Um, I'm going to scream through this so that, I mean, Wayne is sitting here with a hook. But um, one of the reasons that environmental control is such a problem is because you cannot accelerate testing. Most of the failure of environmental control has to do with multiple fluids in a microgravity environment and biological fouling and hazarding. You cannot speed that up. Life does not, you know, you can't cycle it. 15 times a day to, to, to figure out when and how many cycles before it breaks. Biology takes its own time. So really, if we want to be doing a 3D remission to Mars, we need to be testing that now and get 10 years of testing under our belt to know that it'll work for those three years. And I'm going to go away from that now to see if anybody makes a comment, but there's a problem about mission control. There is no more use than you have a problem when you go to Mars. It's Houston. We had a problem 15 minutes ago, and how do you solve that problem? And that's all I had to say at this point, and hopefully Grant, we got some questions. Grant, your uh, talk resonates with me, and I'll take 30 seconds of your question time, because um, I, it's not in a little biography, but most folks know I was a space shuttle flight director for 40 flights over 15 years, and we practiced for a many d disaster drills, launch aborts, collision between spacecraft, fire, you, you name it, we practiced for all of them. But in all those flights, the only time I ever really came close to declaring a spacecraft emergency and causing an early deorbit of the shuttle was when the toilet broke. <laughs> yeah. And you may laugh, that was entirely serious and there are a number of flight rules on it. And, uh, and uh, real space people consider um, life support very important. So to your questions, you're gonna love this first question. How many people do you think could fit inside SpaceX's Starship for a trip to Mars after figuring in the life support systems? Um, in the vehicle he showed, I haven't seen any, uh, any interior layouts of where the tanks are, frankly, so it would be a total guess. Um, at this point in time, I would say seven, <laughs> well, from what I've seen of the outside of it and what I understand from the interior. Okay, uh, a, 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 a human factors question that's kind of a difficult one. What's the state of the art for protecting humans from galactic cosmic radiation in deep space? Um, speed. Um, galactic radiation, unlike uh, SPEs, which are solar proton events, are so high energy that almost no shielding works, frankly. There are, by the time you got a shielding that was practical, it would outweigh the spacecraft. Um, so the real big way to limit the problems with it is to get there as fast as possible and get back as fast as possible. Having said that, I'm not a radiation is the sky is falling type of thing, even though in some ways it kind of is. Um, uh, how much risk are you willing to take? Mainly radiation is measured in risk of, of developing cancer later. Um, and there's a 3% rule that they work with. Uh, I often, uh, when I'm joking around with my NASA colleagues, say that well, if I moved from Tucson to Houston, my, uh, my likelihood of cancer goes up by 3%. So, so uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm not willing to take that risk, because that doesn't make sense to me. But Moving right along. In what year 
That's a good one. In what year do you expect NASA will field a spacesuit that's capable of a significant lunar EVA activities? Um, yeah, uh, the, boy, that, I could dissect that question in a lot of ways. Should NASA build that spacesuit? Um, there is a lot of uh, capability. Collins builds spacesuits, Paragon builds them, uh, along with ILC. Of course, there's a bunch of commercial spacesuits going on. I should mention David Clark there, which is one of the, one of the big ones in the industry, too. Um, it depends a little bit on what you want the suit to do. Uh, I think the biggest problem we have with the suits, if you ask the astronauts, and I've talked to all of them that have walked on the moon but one, um, it wasn't lack of oxygen, water running out or anything. They just said things were falling apart, especially the last ones, Apollo 15, 16, and 17. Zippers were starting to not work. Seals weren't working, stuff like that. It's the dust that's going to be the problem for long-duration spacesuits uh, on, the moon, on the moon, I feel. Well, here's a very popular question that, frankly, I don't understand, but I will ask it. Do you think additive manufacturing can help cover some of the ground concerning having spare parts that may be needed? Um, yeah, I, I, I've uh, given a few lectures on, uh, on uh, 3D manufacturing or additive manufacturing. And, and frankly, um, uh, full disclosure, we, uh, we are actually working in, in tandem with, three, uh, with Made in Space on something. The problem with 3, 3D manufacturing that I see is that it, to use it as a solution means you have to design it into the system. If you design a spacecraft like we do where every single part is selected for optimization, you sometimes use a titanium 246 on one thing, a titanium 44 on another, you use aluminum uh, 6061 or 7075, each one of them is a very different chemical makeup. Can you make a printer that can print all of those and you have to carry the raw materials with you unless you develop a way to make the raw material in space. So if you do not limit the materials you're going to build with a 3D printer, your 3D printers, which break down too, by the way, and the raw material are going to outweigh the vehicle again. So yes, I think it's going to have limited use. It's going to have use for some very good things. One of them I'm, I'm really into is printing food. Um, it, it actually is, uh, there's some that you can print biological stuff now. It's printing food, printing meats, uh, in a way, uh, I see is one of, the, one, of the, um, one of the things for additive manufacturing. Oh, it would be a real contest between growing potatoes with stuff and printing your meat, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Okay, what is the biggest challenge you see for your company at this time? Um, Consistency of, uh, of, of programs. Um, th there's a bunch of different trends going on in our company, uh, in, in our industry right now. One of them is uh, messianic billionaires who want to do everything themselves. Um, that's a little bit of a problem. It's, it's kind of interesting, but uh, let's just say they're not really um, uh, fastidious, fastidious about maintaining your intellectual property uh, and using it uh, with permission. Um, that's one problem. Uh, but frankly, you know, Paragon is one of those companies that actually work in two different ones. I think Mary Lynn Dittmar mentioned this yesterday. We do commercial and we do government. The problem with government is administrations change. We've been through so many different whiplashes, you know, and Obama came in and canceled Constellation. And every, it seems like it's a trend now that you, what the first thing you do is cancel your predecessor's uh, favorite space program. Um, so I see that as a big problem. Uh, but the other one that's very, very uh, pertinent to here is, is STEM education and having a workforce of the future. Um, we are graying. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of on the young side <laughs> to some degree. I like to think so. Um, but finding the talent that's willing to come in and do this, that's one thing I will say. I'll give uh, Elon Musk and, uh, and, and Jeff Bezos and those guys, they've really energized uh, a lot of people. In fact, if you ask uh, recent college graduates uh, in the technical fields, where do they want to go work? It's SpaceX and Blue Origin and stuff like that. But it's still, it's a very tight market right now. It's very hard to find people that are skilled. How might life support systems for a moon base differ from those needed for an orbital outpost like a gateway? Oh, wow, yeah. Um, there's a saying in the industry that uh, 1 6 G of the moon is a lot closer to 1 G than 0. Uh, with, if you're a mathematician, may not make sense, but it surely makes sense in our world. Um, having 1 G allows for separation of gas phases and liquids and stuff like that, um, which makes our job a lot easier in a lot of ways. Um, the, I will th say one thing is, is dust is, is the one, uh, one issue. Also on the moon, 
Um, especially the moon, it's the day-night cycle. Even if you're at the South Pole, you're, you're mitigating that a little bit, uh, but if you want to land anywhere else, taking a, uh, a two-week night and a two-week day is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, while we're talking about the differences, uh, what are the cost differences between the ECLIS systems for those two different operations, orbital and lunar surface? Um, wow, that, that's sort of how, how, how big is a rock you want. Um, it depends on how sophisticated you want to be. Uh, you know, it, it's, I, I won't name prices up here because uh, frankly, I think if, especially if uh, Bower Sox is in the audience, um, because we're in competition for a whole bunch of environmental control with lunar landers and stuff, I don't want to mention any dollar numbers. Um, in general, because of the amount of things you want to do on the surface, the surface environmental control system is probably going to be more expensive because you will be having suit air locks. Yes, you have the locks up, in the, up on the spacecraft to get in and out of them, but you have the dust mitigation control. Um, yeah, you, you just generally put more capability on the vehicle that's landed if you're gonna be there for a long period of time. You, you had a chart that said heritage is misleading. Can you explain that a little bit? Oh, okay. I have a perfect example of that, and it's, it's uh, Robin Gatins gave me this example. She was on a panel that I was chairing uh, a few years ago. Um, for one thing, I've said we've got to redesign systems. I talked a little bit about the the, the International uh, Space Station has been a great test test bed for testing stuff, but you can only you only can learn as much as you've sort of baked into how you do things up there. Um, but the, the example she gave was really interesting. There was a piece of environmental control hardware. I can't remember what it was. I know I had it one time. And it got built and was up there for 10, 10 and a half years, and it failed. So they went and they ordered another one from the same manufacturer, same part number, got it up on orbit, and it lasted three months. Um, and so, it's like, wait, what, what is that? But there are lemon problems, and that's another reason why you gotta get things out and test it. Um, but also, uh, just being in the industry and having been in the space industry for 30 years, I've seen a lot of arguments, and I gotta admit, I put them in my proposals too, about how much you have heritage on stuff, but customers change requirements a little bit. Let's do it the same, except uh, the most expensive five words in our business is while we're at it. Um, <laughs> That, that really will kill you, and that's why heritage always seems to disappear. Thank you, Grant. This is, as the comment here says, awesome talk, learn so much. Oh. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll be outside if you have questions. <laughs>